the rays of aspect and the higher initiations. We completed our consideration of the effect of the four rays of attribute upon humanity as a whole and upon the individual disciple. If you will study the relationship of these rays to each other, you will discover that the energies which made their impact upon the would-be initiate were, first of all, two rays. The seventh ray of ceremonial order and the fifth ray of science, which are both along the line of the first ray of will or power, plus two other rays, the sixth ray of devotion or idealism and the fourth ray of harmony through conflict, which are both along the line of the second ray of love wisdom. All these rays of attribute were, in connection with the initiations concerned, functioning within the realm of knowledge. It is a knowledge, however, dedicated eventually to spiritual intent and attained through conflict. We come now to the consideration of the three rays of aspect and their general and momentous effect upon mankind in this cycle and upon the disciple preparing for initiation. We are dealing therefore with ray one, will or power active in connection with the fifth initiation. Ray two, love wisdom, active in connection with the seventh initiation. And ray three, active intelligence, active in connection with the sixth initiation. The united activity of these rays lifts humanity to the higher spiritual realm and concerns those initiations which lie a long way ahead of mankind. They lie also a considerable distance on the path from the present point of the average disciple. I am dealing with them, however, as best I can, because the next 100 years will see a demonstrable an orientation of trained disciples towards the higher perception. You must make what you can of this information. It concerns primarily action within the ashram, action which is, however, concerned with human development and welfare. The eighth and ninth initiations, governed by the four rays of attribute working in synthesis with the three rays of aspect and working simultaneously, will necessarily be far beyond our comprehension. There is little I shall be able to tell you because I know but little myself. Does this last remark surprise you? It should not. From the exoteric angle, evolution means growth and development and is largely applied to the form side of nature. And the term evolution might thus be confined entirely to the evolution of the form nature. It might also be applied to development within the three worlds and to the third aspect of the divine life. However, from the esoteric angle, evolution means a steadily increasing sensitivity to light and illumination. A master may not possess all knowledge possible from the exoteric angle. This he does not need because, after evolution, along the line of knowledge decided for him by his ray type, he is on the way of light, and the light which is in him and in which he lives and moves and functions serves a dual purpose. It can be used, first it can be used to ascertain whatever is needed in the realm of knowledge by the revelation of where the needed information can be found. This is far more literally so than you realize. It was through the use of this form of light that I, for instance, found AAB, Alice A. Bailey. I was searching for a secretary with more than the usual education and perception generally to be found, and the light revealed her from the personality angle in the three worlds. Second, it can be used also to reveal to the master that which lies ahead for him and those further reaches of awareness to which he knows he must eventually attain. The lower aspects of this light are in reality generated by the soul, whilst the higher are those which emanate from the monad. When an initiate takes the fifth initiation, with which we are now going to deal, he has to demonstrate his facility in using the light available by initiating some new project in line with the hierarchical plan and in tune with his own ray impulses. This project must, must have both an exoteric side and esoteric. To illustrate further, the exoteric side of the work which I, as a newly made master, had, pur had purposed to do can be seen in the activities which I have been enabled to accomplish in the outer world through the books which AAB has taken down for me and by the establishing of the service activities associated with the arcane school. 
The exoteric side is, of course, known to me, but an analysis of it would be of no service to you, as you are not yet of the required initiate consciousness. You can see, however, how the above information can throw light upon our immediate theme, which is Initiation 5, Revelation, and Ray 1, the energy of the will to good and power. This initiation has always been called in the Christian church by the name of the resurrection, whereas it is the seventh initiation, which is the true resurrection. The correct name for the fifth initiation is the initiation of revelation. This signifies the power to wield light as the carrier of life to all in the three worlds, and to know, likewise, the next step to be taken upon the way of the higher evolution. This way is revealed to the initiate in a new light and with an entirely different significance when the fifth initiation is taken. It is the true time of emergence from the tomb of darkness and constitutes an entrance into a light of an entirely different nature to any hitherto experienced. Development and revelation, or if you so prefer it, a developing revelation, form essentially the entire theme and objective of all activity upon our planet. This gives us a clue to the goal of the planetary logos. All life, from the first descent of the soul into, the, into incarnation, is only a series of revelations, all of which lead up to the revelation accorded at the fifth initiation. The relation between the fifth and the seventh initiations is exceedingly deep and mysterious. It is the revelation accorded in the fifth initiation which makes the seventh initiation possible. The master, as he emerges at the fifth initiation into the light of day, realizes in that light, one, the true and hitherto unknown significance of the three worlds which he has viewed almost entirely from the angle of meaning. Now its significance is apparent, and the revelation is so tremendous that he withdraws into the world of light and joins his brothers. He gathers all his forces and seeks new light upon the plan. That light shines forth, and with the force of its revealing power, new loyalties arise. New goals are seen, and that which shall be, and the thing which is, both become lost in the radiant life, light of revelation. 2. That the first vibration or influencing energy of the cosmic ray of prevailing energy in its highest aspect is the ray of love wisdom, and this is now contacted. This is made possible by the master's response to the first ray of power, or of the will to good, experienced in its second aspect at the fifth initiation. Forget not that all rays have three aspects, and that all three can be contacted by the human consciousness of the spiritual man, thus placing at his disposal the energies of the seven rays and of the twenty-one forces. It is this synthesis which is revealed at the fifth initiation, and, as I said above, the combination of these forces produces the ascension. This is an exceeding great mystery, and one which cannot as yet be grasped by you. From the height of the Mount of Ascension, light is thrown upon the hierarchical plan in such a manner that the purpose in the mind of the planetary logos is, for the first time, truly grasped. 3. From that height also, the mystery of the human soul is revealed, and a greater triangular pattern will be seen, relating the human spirit to the world of forms, to the united hierarchy, and to the council chamber of the Lord. Upon this I may not here enlarge, for we must not diverge too far from our study. One thing only can be said. From that high place, Atma Bodhi Manas, will, love, and intelligent action, can be seen in united activity and the theory of an existing plan and the belief in the three divine aspects or in the trinity of energies is factually demonstrated. The first ray of will or power is distinguished by the highest known divine quality. There are others still higher. In the word, good will, the secret purpose of the planetary logos is hidden. It is being slowly brought to the attention of humanity by means of the three phrases, God is love, good will, and the will to good. These three phrases in reality concern the three aspects of the first ray. When a master takes the fifth initiation, he already knows the significance of the first two aspects and must become consciously aware of the highest aspect, 
the will to good. He has developed in himself the love necessary to salvation, his own and that of those he loves, his fellow men. All his actions and his thinking are qualified by goodwill in its esoteric sense, and the significance of the will to good lies ahead of him and will be later revealed. As this first ray is not in incarnation at this time, and therefore souls who can fully express it are absent, the entire theme anent this type of energy and its influence and quality when related to the energies and the forces is most difficult to express. Each great ray, as it comes into incarnation, transforms the speech of the cycle, enriches the existent vocabulary, and brings new knowledge to humanity. The many civilizations, past and present, are the result of this. I would ask you to, to consider the relation of the fifth initiation, the fifth ray of science, and the first ray of will, for there lies the key to the revelation accorded to the initiate master. As you can see, we are venturing into realms far beyond your comprehension. But the effort to grasp the unattainable and to exercise the mind along a line of abstract thought is ever of value. It must be remembered, therefore, and I reiterate, that the revelation accorded to the dis disciple initiate is along the line of the first ray of will or power. And that is a ray which is as yet a long way from full manifestation. From one angle, it is, of course, always in manifestation, for it is the ray which holds the planet and all that is upon it in one coherent manifesting whole. The reason for this coherent synthesis is the evolutionary effort to work out divine purpose. The first ray ever implements that purpose. From another angle, it is cyclic in its manifestation. Here, I mean from the angle of recognized manifestation, and such is the case at this time. The effect of Ray 1 on humanity today. Owing to extraplanetary stimulation, to the immediate planetary crisis, and to the present invocative cry of humanity, energy from Shambhala has been permitted to play upon the center which is called the race of men, and has produced two potent results. First, the world war has precipitated, and secondly, the fission of the atom, resulting in the atomic bomb, was brought about. Both these events were made possible by the pouring in of the energy and power of the third aspect of the first ray of power or will. This is the lowest aspect, and definite material effects were produced. The destroyer aspect was therefore the first aspect to take effect. It split the thought form of materialistic living, which was governing and controlling humanity everywhere upon the mental plane, and at the same time it produced a great agent of destruction upon the physical plane. Thus was the new era ushered in. Thus was the stage set for a better future. This was the intent and the purpose of those who composed the council chamber of the Lord. It rests with humanity itself to take advantage of the proffered opportunity which this destructive manifestation made possible. Shambhala having acted in this manner, it is nevertheless the hierarchy which will bring into expression a measure of the second aspect of the first ray of will or power, and it is for this that the hierarchy is preparing. It is for this event that the Christ is fitting himself to be the distributing agent and the directing factor with the, con with the concentrated assistance of the united hierarchy. It is this that will begin to manifest when he appears. You have here the true reason for his proclaimed coming or reappearance. The distinction between material living and spiritual living will be clearly demonstrated. This is made possible by the cleavage of the ancient materialistic thought form on mental levels. The reorientation of human thinking, as this fact is grasped, will have its first results upon emotional levels through the focused expression of human goodwill. This is the lowest aspect of the second ray of love wisdom, implemented and strengthened by the second aspect of the first ray of will. On the physical plane, the great scientific discovery, called colloquially the splitting of the atom, 
will be turned eventually to the production of those conditions which will enable mankind to follow the good, the beautiful, and the true. This men will then be able to do, freed from the dread presence of purely materialistic thinking. This is no idle vision or vague dream. Many scientists today, and particularly those who love their fellow men, are not only visioning the non-destructive aspect of atomic energy, but are already engaged in harnessing for the good of humanity some of its products and its radioactive properties. Curiously enough, it is the wise, controlled use of the results of this scientific adventure in connection with the atomic bomb, which will eventually bring about a specific revelation of the nature of certain forces in relation to light. This event will transform world thinking and lead to a new type of transmutative process, as far as man is concerned. It must not be inferred from the above that humanity as a whole will be taking the fifth initiation, for such is not the case. Many advanced souls, perhaps amounting to many thousands, may and will take this initiation. But the masses of men everywhere, constituting the sum total of the world disciple, will eventually take either the first or the second initiation. The effect, however, of hierarchical happenings in conjunction with Shambhala will lead finally to the great stimulation of the fifth principle of Manas, the intelligence principle in man. A revelation which is not perceived, which remains unrelated and unexpressed, is of no true service to mankind except from a purely subjective standpoint. Nevertheless, through the proposed stimulation, through the efforts of those who have taken or will take the fifth initiation, and through the new direction of first ray energy from Shambhala, the mental plane will receive such an inflow of energy that the thinking principle, the reasoning factor within humanity, will reach new heights. Thus will the light stream forth into the minds of men, and the first stanza of the inv invocation prove that it can and does receive an answer to its invocative appeal. It would be good to let your spiritual imagination look forward into the future, and then vision, if you can, what is the true significance of the tremendous activity of the hierarchy. One of the signs of the coming of this new light and energy inflow is a definitely curious one. It is to be found in the instability of the human mental mechanism and the human thinking processes at this time. This is due to their premature response to the new incoming potency. It is a mass reaction, and therefore the statistical returns are somewhat misleading. It is the unready who thus react, and this entails no possible reflection upon those thus distressed. They are to be found today in all classes and nations. The law of rebirth will take care of this reaction, and in the next incarnation, these same people will enter a physical body with a better equipment. In reality, it is this energy from Shambhala and its third and destructive aspect which is acting upon certain members of the human family and unfortunately evoking a ready response. I tell you this for your encouragement. Destruction always evokes questioning in minds attuned to human welfare and in those thinkers who are apprehensive to the suffering to which their fellow men are subjected. One of the most difficult things for the average thinking man to understand and to interpret is the destructive processes of what he, for the lack of a better name, calls the will of God. This is one of the results and only one of a purely materialistic civilization which has laid all its emphasis upon the form side of experience and thus regards physical well-being and physical comfort plus material possessions as the true goal of all human effort. It is upon this widespread attitude and reaction that the new incoming light will concentrate itself. As the light reveals reality, the world of phenomena and the world of spiritual values will enter into a better directed relation. From all the above, you will note that some of the effects upon humanity as a whole and the skeleton structure of the new and beautiful future will take place as a result of the new incoming first ray activity. No details, no details can yet be given, but enough has been written down and at the basic predisposing cause to enable you who read to ponder upon the possible effect, spiritually speaking. 
What is coming is a civilization of a different yet still material nature, but animated by a growing registration by the masses everywhere of an emerging spiritual objective which will transform all life, give new value and purpose to that which is material. Next, we must consider what will be the effect of this first ray energy upon the individual disciple as he prepares for and undergoes the fifth initiation and keys himself up for the promised revelation, thus laying himself open to an entirely new inflow of force. This he must do consciously. It is conscious absorption of energy and its conscious assimilation, plus its conscious use which distinguishes the initiate from the rest of the mankind. There are, of course, many degrees of this desired consciousness. What the initiate will receive as a result of first ray energy will be an inflow of the second aspect of this ray, a blazing forth of the light which will focus clearly for him and in a flash of time, the significance of that which is slowly being revealed on earth. He sees this vision in Toto for the first time. At the fourth initiation, he responds to the third aspect of this ray, the aspect of destruction. This divested him of everything, and finally, eternally destroyed all that which held him in the three worlds of human endeavor. Thus was harmony produced through conflict, and the success of the individual initiate is the guarantee of the final success of the world disciple. When it comes to a consideration of the effect of this ray, at the time of the fifth initiation, you must bear in mind that the disciple has passed in a previous incarnation through the initiation of renunciation and has established himself within a condition of complete harmony as a result of conflict, a conflict which has been raging for millennia of years and whose goal has ever been revelation. Just as a camera has to be correctly focused in order to register correctly that which is visioned, so this harmony once finally achieved, can be regarded as a form of focused orientation. Throughout the many lives the disciple has lived, there have been many such moments, but they were brief in passing, serving only to stir the aspiration into activity. With the disciple of the fourth initiation, submitting himself to the fifth initiation, the orientation and the focus attained remains a permanent condition. This prefaces an entirely new cycle of spiritual experience, the experience of the higher evolution, leading to that great moment when the revelation of the seven paths is accorded to him at the following or sixth initiation of decision. Where the ordinary everyday man is concerned, the propelling aspiration, if I may use such an unusual phrase, is of a material nature and concerns his successful progress in the world of everyday physical plane life. It might be wise to consider ambitions as the lower expression of aspiration. This ambition covers all the many phases of the path of evolution, from the ambition of the raw, savage, and primeval, primeval times to gain food and shelter for himself and family to the ambition of the modern businessman to reach the height of financial gain or power. Having achieved that goal, it frequently happens that, on the way to the higher octave of ambition or aspiration, there may come a cycle of lives where the ambition is directed to the creative arts. Next comes gradually the transmutation of all these ambitions into a steadily growing and consciously spiritual aspiration. The man treads, then the probationary path, and eventually the path of discipleship. And as his spiritual ambition grows and is paralleled by an equally steady growth in mental realization, he passes from initiation to initiation, until there comes the culminating fifth initiation. All his past realizations, both his material and also his spiritual realization, have been renounced. He stands entirely free from every aspect of desire. The spiritual will has been substituted for desire. Then, reinforced by the inflow of the first ray shambolic energy and offering no obstructions or hindrances from within himself as a personality, he is in a position to receive the stimulation which will enable him to see that which is to be revealed and to accept revelation. Transmuting it into that definite realization which will enable him to live by means of its light. You have therefore certain words which are concerned with the method whereby the vision is accorded and revelation given. First, ambition implemented by determination. 
second aspiration, implemented by devotion or one-pointed attention. Third, revelation, implemented by the will in its two lower aspects. And four, realization, implemented by the will in its highest aspect. That, briefly, is the evolutionary story of the initiate in good standing, and it is basically the story of the will to self-betterment and the will to human service, goodwill, and finally, the will to good. You can see, therefore, how the great first aspect of divinity, through its three aspects, is the hidden, basic, motivating potency of life and of evolution from the very dawn of the evolutionary cycle. The initiate in good standing looks into the heart of things. He has forced his way to the very heart of the sun, using those words in a planetary and not a solar sense, and from that vantage point, he becomes aware of the central spiritual sun and the way of the higher evolution which leads inevitably to that assured center of the Most High. Three worlds of material living and the inner world of meaning which the soul has revealed to him are now left behind. He is suddenly confronted with the world of significances, with the true world of causes and of origination, and by the realm of the universal. He discovers that all he had thought and that the law of cause and effect was so limited that, in the light of his higher evolution, it has practically become meaningless, except as the ABC whereby he can teach the children of men. He realizes through the revelation accorded more clearly than has hitherto been possible, the purpose of the planetary logos. From the time of the third initiation, this purpose has been gradually revealed itself, revealing itself. He sees it expressing itself through Sanat Kumara, who is the personality expression of the planetary logos. During the coming interval and cycle of preparation for the sixth initiation, that purpose will burst upon him in blazing and synthetic glory. The way to the central spiritual sun is therefore revealed to him, and he knows that he faces a period of intense preparation, not training, as that word is usually understood, for a length of time determined by world need, the nature of his service, and certain undefinable ready conditions. He has to fulfill the magnetic condition which will enable him to form his own ashram. He has to unfold a new phase of selective spiritual discrimination. The word discrimination is, however, misleading, because the form of it which he can now express carries no quality of rejection or of separation. It is a right knowledge and understanding of those karmically linked to him, a right use of an impelling attractive force, which will, occultly speaking, attract the attention of those who should enter his ashram, plus an esoteric process of blending himself and his ashram into the full body of the hierarchy. New ashrams within the hierarchy present much the same type of difficulty and problems as the entrance of a new disciple into an ashram. It might be said, that which holds the hierarchy together and that which produces a coherent ashram is the revelation received in the light which that revelation produced and which leads to realization. Ashramic responsibility, constant service within the planetary life, and the subjection of himself and of his ashram to cyclic stimulation from Shambhala, plus certain mysterious processes which have naught to do with form or consciousness, but with the sensitivity of the universe, occupy the interim between the fifth and the sixth initiations. Initiation six, decision, ray three. We have concluded our study of the rays and the five initiations, and there is little more that I can tell you about the remaining four initiations, except one or two points and then the sixth initiation of decision. This initiation is governed by the third ray of active intelligence. The only reason that I am making a few comments upon the sixth initiation is that at this time, a number of the masters are taking this great step that has a most peculiar application to the time of the appearance of the Christ. At this initiation of decision, the master concerned decides usually which of the seven paths he intends to tread. Some masters decide to remain until the close of our planetary life, at which time the last weary pilgrim will have found his way home. The earth can then be prepared for a new humanity. When this happens, our planet will no longer be known as the planet of sorrow and of pain, 
which will be distinguished by a quality of tranquility and by an aura of calm potency wherein the will of God to be demonstrated in the next solar system will be focused. This, in some mysterious way, will enable the solar logos, not the planetary logos, to bring the first great divine aspect, that of will or power, into expression throughout the solar system. Instead, therefore, of the statement which explains our present solar system, God is love, we shall have a dynamic expression of the will to good, an energy which will have been generated to some extent upon our earth. This is the reward which the present earth, humanity, will reap. And this is the consummation of the preordained task of our planetary logos. He undertook when he came into incarnation through the medium of our little planet to aid the work of the solar logos in expressing the will aspects of divinity. It might be simpler if I said that the experiment of manifesting the first divine aspect through the medium of form and through a humanity which has behind it the experience of five initiations and is therefore expressing intelligent love be attempted. The statement is necessarily misleading, but it embodies a truth and indicates the unfinished story of solar expression. Today, however, in taking this sixth initiation, all of the masters so doing, and under the suggestion of the Christ, continue to make the decision which will control their future progress on one of the seven paths of the higher evolution. But at the same time, all of them are postponing this proposed progress upon their chosen path in order, for a brief time, to implement and aid the work of the Christ and help towards the externalization of the hierarchy through the medium of certain of its ashrams. They will also form a protecting wall around the Christ and act as liaison officers between their great leader and the avatar of synthesis. Christ himself took the initiation some time ago and passed through the resurrection initiation and the experience of the seventh initiation. These masters can, in a mysterious fashion, implement the expression of the divine will to good on earth. They will work in collaboration with those masters whose ashrams will be the first to be anchored on earth in the sense of physical expression because, esoterically speaking, it is the will of God which holds them there. For ages, the potency of that which lies behind the fifth initiation in the planetary sense and not in connection with the individual initiation with its revelation indicating first-rate purpose has held sway on earth. Knowledge, the revealing of the mysteries, the attainment of scientific achievement, producing the activity of the fifth plane of mind, has governed human thinking and advancement. God and nature, i.e. planetary logos and concrete and material expression, has been revealed, and this has culminated in that tremendous expression of power, the atomic bomb. Now, the potency of that which lies behind the sixth initiation will take hold of the evolutionary process and will implement divine purpose. What that potency and truth may be, we cannot yet know. We do know, however, that it is closely related to the will to synthesis. This will enable the Christ to break down the barriers and the separating walls which selfish, self-centered, and materialistic humanity, largely with the aid of the churches of the world, with their materialistic bias, has built, thereby letting in the light of understanding and clearing the way for a fuller expression of the will of God. I felt that the practical aspects of what the masters are doing might prove useful to you. As to the remaining three initiations. Initiation 7, the resurrection, array 2. Initiation 8, the great transition, rays 4, 5, 6, 7, the four minor rays. Initiation 9, the refusal, rays 1, 2, and 3, three major rays. An analysis of them would prove to you that your comprehension has not yet been developed to the point where understanding is possible. If you would therefore be, it would therefore be a waste of time further to consider them. If you will reread the instructions earlier given upon the seven paths, you may glean some ideas about these later initiations. They would still, however, be impossible of application and practical usefulness at your particular stage of evolutionary development. The seven and the nine initiations of our planetary life. 
Now let us look at these initiations from the angle of the planetary life, as far as in us lies. We have for long looked at them from the angle of humanity, the world disciple, as well as from the angle of the individual initiate, but it must not be forgotten that these initiations have also a planetary significance. From the standpoint of the hierarchy and of Shambhala, they constitute the major factors which make possible the initiatory process on Earth among men. This naturally means in relation to our planetary logos. It must never be forgotten that it is the progress forward upon his chosen cosmic path which makes the entire evolutionary process possible. Just as a master who has taken the fifth initiation has to project his own specific undertaking through the medium of his ashram, thus proving his response to the will aspect of the planetary logos and making himself responsible for a phase of the planetary plan, so a planetary logos has likewise, under the law of synthesis, to carry forward a specific project in line with the will of the solar logos. This our planetary logos, Sanat Kamara, is in process of doing providing a definite culture wherein the germ of the solar will can be fostered in one of its aspects. Then, in conjunction with a similar project going on in two other planets, thus fostering two other aspects, the nucleus of the third solar system will be brought eventually into expression. It is hard for the human mind to appreciate this basic synthesis and this relationship which exists throughout the entire solar system with the planetary logoi implementing divine purpose. Men cannot yet grasp the relations within the personality aspect of our planetary logos, the Earth, and all that is therein. But that synthesis exists and is the relating factor between our Earth and the Sun, between the various planetary logoi and the solar logos. All that we can do is to get a general picture of the planetary initiations, the seven initiations, and the nine. The only manner in which we can grasp even a small measure of planetary intention is through a study of the great civilizations which have been developed by humanity under impression from the highest spiritual sources on our planet. These have hitherto reached us via the hierarchy. To these civilizations must be added the cultures which have evolved out of them. This obviously we cannot do, for it would require research into all the known and the unknown historical periods and cycles, plus a consideration of all the evidence, anthropological, architectural, and sociological. To this approach, to the intent and the purpose of the planetary logos must be added a consideration of certain crises in the life of mankind, which are in the nature of minor initiations to which the planetary logos has subjected himself in the sense that he is the initiator. Humanity, being the most highly developed evolutionary product upon our planet, reacts to these initiations. They produce world events and those stupendous points of crisis which, up to date, have worked destructively where the form aspect is concerned, but which have developed into those stages of sensitive unfoldment and progression when the work of the builders, the second divine aspect, is added to and takes advantage of the liberty or release brought about by the destroyer, the first aspect. They are always these two phases. There are always these two phases. Through the past civilizations and their eventual catastrophic destruction, the planetary logos has gradually prepared the ground or planetary field for the planting of the germ of will, the nurturing of which is a future part of human destiny. The seven major phases of the unfoldment of the human race, of which our modern Aryan race is the fifth, are in the nature of the seven planetary initiations or unfoldments. The word initiation is not to be understood in the exact sense in which human initiations are understood and interpreted. Men are initiated into phases of the divine consciousness through applied stimulation, whereby their vehicles evidence ready readiness. In connection with planetary logos, it is he who initiated a new process in seven phases, preparatory to the expected divine planning, planting. It must be borne in mind the use of the word planting is purely symbolic. Each phase brings the original divine purpose or spiritual project nearer to fruition, and it is for this that Sanat Kamara came into manifestation or incarnation. Each of these phases affects all the four kingdoms in nature, producing a higher stage of sensitivity in each successive one, but it is only in the fourth kingdom, the human, 
that there exists the possibility of conscious registering in recognition of divine intent and a faint vibrating response to the will aspect of divinity. It has taken a millennia of years to bring this about. When you remember that it has only been in the present world crisis that the planetary logos dared subject the forms in all the four kingdoms to the direct stimulation of his embellying will, you will realize the long, long patience, which is perhaps his most distinctive characteristic. Patience is a quality of will. It is of the nature of a strict adherence to a fixed intention. At each transition from one civilization to another, each being built upon the cultural seed of the preceding one, after a due flowering of the civilization, we could say of Sanat Kamara what has been said of the Christ, that he sees of the travail of his soul and is satisfied. So blind are men that when a civilization comes to an end, when the familiar mode of cultural expression is brought, as is usual, under the hand of the destroyer, humanity regards it as a major disaster and dreads and fears the ruin which usually surrounds such an event. But from the standpoint of the world of significances, progress is seen, and the day of fulfillment draws much nearer. Our modern civilization today, under the hammer of the destroyer aspect, is being changed. Old things are passing away, having served their purpose. The new thing is not yet noted or appreciated, though already present. The work of preparation for the planting of the germ or seed of the divine will on earth is nearly over. When the hierarchy is externalized, and man as a whole recognize the position on earth of the Christ and of his church invisible, the union of all souls made perfect, which is a true description of the hierarchy, then, in a manner unforeseen by humanity, Shambhala will assume control, and from the council chamber of Sanat Kamara will issue forth the sower of the seed. He will sow it within the ground prepared by humanity, and thus the future is assured, not for the planetary logos alone, but for the greater whole in which our planet plays its little part. That moment lies ahead in the civilization, which shall be, and in the next great race, which, sh which will emerge out of all our modern races and nations, the sowing will take place. The next race will be a fusion of the whole, and a worldwide recognition of the one humanity is an essential prerequisite of the sowing. It is the creation of this universal recognition, which will be one of the major tasks of the reappearing Christ and his attended hierarchy. When the little wills of men are beginning to respond on a measurably large scale to the greater will of the divine life, then the major task of Shambhala will become possible. Nevertheless, prior to that, humanity must respond to the light and the love, which are the preparatory streams of spiritual energy, and which are already pouring forth in response to human invocation. In comprehending the planetary initiatory processes instituted by the planetary logos, men must relate them to the great crises, which have occurred in all the races of men. Just as the initiate disciple passes from one initiation to another through a process of continuously leaving behind those aspects of the form life, which have been destroyed by him as useless, so humanity leaves behind civilization after civilization under the stimulus of the evolving purpose of Sanat Kumara, who initiates constantly that which is new and that which, better, which will better serve his will. Men are apt to think that the whole evolutionary process, including the development of the subhuman kingdoms in nature, is merely a mode whereby men can reach perfection and develop better forms through which to manifest that perfection. But in the last analysis, human progress is purely relative and incidental. The factor of supreme importance is the ability of the planetary logos to carry out his primary intention and bring his project to a sound consummation thus fulfilling the task given to him by his great superior, the Solar Logos. The eighth and the ninth initiations, of which neither you nor I can know practically anything, relate to the initiations of those methods and techniques whereby the seed of will, which will later flower into the third solar system, can be nurtured and fostered and its growth promoted. This nurturing and fostering will be the task of a group of masters to be developed in the next major race who, at the initiation of decision, the sixth initiation, will dedicate themselves as a group to the path of earth service. They will specifically and with full enlightenment pledge themselves to the promotion of Sanat Kumara's project. With this, our present group of masters are not specifically concerned. 
Their task is the application of the evolutionary process with, an, with a view to the preparation of the field of the world for the future divine sowing. More I cannot tell you. All I have, all I have done is to give you a hint as to the significance of the in, initiations instituted by the Lord of the world. These are not, may I repeat, initiations to which the planetary logos is himself subjected. The world crises, which ha, which ever precede initiation on a planetary scale, are part of the preparatory work, tests and trials, which make possible some cosmic initiation to which he has been and will eventually be subjected. With them we have no concern, nor would you understand if I were to be in any way explicit. The law of analogy and of correspondences breaks down at a certain point upon the path of understanding, and something new and utterly different enters in. The law of analogy holds good when considering the microcosm within the life of the macrocosm. But if you ventured outside that limited and manifested life, if that were possible, which it is not, you would contract other you would contact other laws and other approaches to truth existent on cosmic levels. There is little more that I can tell you anent the planetary initiations, or as they might be more correctly called, the planetary initiatory processes. These affect our entire planetary life, but are not essentially initiations as we understand the term, or as the word could be applied to Sanat Kumara. They are a definite part of cosmic process, and particularly of solar evolution, but they are, as we have seen, only preparatory to that initiation for which our world was made, the manifestation on earth of the highest of the three aspects, the will of God, as it is universally called. The significance of the initiations. We now start our consideration of the nine initiations, only this time we shall be occupied with the relationship and the detail connected with each initiation, viewing them when possible from the angle of the hierarchy and its effort on behalf of the evolutionary progress of the race, and not so much from the angle of the soul-infused personality of the disciple. It must be remembered from the start that no disciple can pass through the initiatory experience unless he is a soul-infused individual, is consciously aware on soul levels of the various happenings, possibilities, undertakings, and implications. In all the many books which I have given to the world, I have taught much anent initiation. I have sought to bring a saner, more reasonable presentation of these great crises in the life of every disciple. It is wise to note that initiation is in reality a crisis, a climaxing event, and is only truly brought about when the disciple has learned patience, endurance, and sagacity in emerging from the many preceding and less important crises. An initiation is a culminating episode, made possible because of the self-inspired discipline to which the disciple has forced himself to conform. Much has been said in the occult books about the preparatory work to be done and the effort which such a task entails, plus the realization of the consequences initiated and expressing themselves through the individual aspirant. Little has been said and then the more important truth that initiation admits a man into some area or level of the divine consciousness into a plane, or rather a state of being, hitherto regarded as sealed and closed. I shall not touch upon the ray effects, because we have already considered them, and because each level of consciousness, each phase or revealed area of the lighted way, is open to souls on all the rays into every type of initiate. From the standpoint of the hierarchy, it is not the individual initiate who is of importance, but the groups in every land who face initiation and who fall into three categories. The first, those in the group who have caught the vision, who accept the fact of the hierarchy and of proffered opportunity, but who are nevertheless quite unready for their next step and must be taught and prepared to take it. Yet they are set apart for fulfillment as it is esoterically called, and in spite of fluctuations and the many vicissitudes of the path, they will eventually attain their goal. Second, those in preparation for some specific initiation, particularly the first initiation to the third, inclusive. They have set their hands to the plow, another way of saying symbolically that they are toiling for and serving their fellow men. 
And third, those who have had the needed training and await the hour of initiation. As I have said, the first two initiations, those of the birth and the baptism, are not regarded by the hierarchy as major initiations. They are in the nature of initiations of the threshold and are simply phases of or preparatory to the third initiation, as occult students call it, which is in reality the first major initiation. This must be most carefully held in mind, for these initiations indicate the process through which the personality can become soul-infused and the energy of the spiritual triad can make its presence felt. For the sake of clarity, however, and because the birth and baptism initiations have been counted in with the true major initiations by the modern teachers of theosophy and similar occult bodies, and because people are there or accustomed to consider them, we will preserve the old method of counting them. The thought of soul infusion must be held in mind, a soul indwelling which culminates at the third initiation, and of monadic control which increasingly possesses the soul infused personality. This higher possessiveness steadily increases from the time of the third initiation until the seventh initiation. After the seventh initiation, a condition can be seen which is extraplanetary in nature and of which little can be known. This brings in, for the first time, a registration or recognition of cosmic consciousness. Let us now consider these initiations one by one. Initiation 1. The Birth at Bethlehem I have preserved the above Christian nomenclature because of its familiarity and because, symbolically speaking, it conveys an aspect of major truth. Just as the birth of a child is an entrance into light, literally speaking, and the beginning of an entirely new way of life, so each successive initiation is in an exactly similar manner, an entrance into light, involving the revelation of a different world to the one hitherto known and the undergoing of entirely new experiences. If students would keep the symbology and this definition carefully in mind, they would arrive at a keener concept of the processes which lie ahead of them. This is particularly true in connection with this first initiation. The analogy holds good from the very dawn of history, where humanity is considered. In ancient Lemuria, with the coming in of the mental idea and mechanism, the low-grade animal life, which to a certain extent looked human, but was definitely mindless, knowing, and unseeing, became suddenly aware of that which threw light upon its way. It meant little to the animal men of those days, but it came increasingly to have significance as millennia of years elapsed. Civilizations came and went, races developed and disappeared. In Lemurian days, the indwelling light of perception, though it was a perception so remote from ours as to be practically inconceivable, revealed the physical world and that found upon it which the human being of that time would deem desirable. Later, in Atlantean times, that same indwelling light and unfolding light of the mind served to reveal the world of emotions, and in the latter, later half of that period it revealed the more aesthetic values. The arts began to flourish, color and beauty were registered. In our more modern Aryan race, the light has revealed the world of thought and has brought us to a synthesis of the senses. These senses were developed in earlier cycles of human living. Each of these three races, in a mysterious manner, has a correspondence on a racial scale to the first three initiations. Today, as we enter the new era, the symbology of the fourth initiation, that of the renunciation, has application. When men face the necessity of renouncing the material values and of substituting the spiritual, the ferment of the initiation process goes on all the time, undermining the materialism of the race of men, revealing more and more of the reality underlying the phenomenal world, the only world recognized by the Lemurians, and at the same time, providing that cultural field of experience in which these those sons of men who are ready to do so can undergo the five initiations technically understood. This is the factor of importance. This, therefore, is our starting point. The historical process can and will reveal the gradual entrance of mankind into ever-expanding lighted areas of consciousness. Into these areas, the way of evolutionary unfoldment has led the race of men right up to the point where there are many, many thousands and millions, if you consider all of humanity, those in incarnation today and those that are out of incarnation upon the inner planes 
who have been enabled to step out of the lighted field of three full three worlds into another area where the light of the mind can be blended with the still greater light of the soul. They have in past lives, even though recollection may be lacking, undergone the birth experience and initiation. And as such, and as a result of this, that which can reveal what the mind is unable to illumine is now developing and functioning within them. The light of life is now available, in a sense far more literally true than you can at this time perceive, and each successive initiation will see this fact more clearly demonstrated. The birth initiation lies behind in the experience of many, and this is factually proved by the lives of those who are consciously and willingly oriented towards the light, who see a wider world than that of their own selfish interests, who are sensitive to the Christ life and to the spiritual consciousness in their, of, in their fellow men, and who see a horizon and vistas of contact unperceived by the average man. They realize a possible spiritual achievement unknown and undesired by those whose lives are conditioned entirely by either the emotions or the lower concrete mind. At this stage of unfoldment, they have a sense of conscious dualism, knowing the fact of the existence of that something other than the phenomenal emotional and mental self. The first initiation might be regarded as the goal and the reward of the mystical experience. It is fundamentally not an occult experience in the true sense of the term, for it is seldom accurately realized or consciously prepared for, as is the case of the later initiations. And this is why the first two initiations are not considered major initiations. In the mystical realization, there is naturally and normally an emphasis upon dualism. But in the new era of enfoldment, visioned and later to be struggled for and attained, initiation by initiation, unity is achieved and dualism disappears. Students should therefore have in mind the following definite occult concept. The mystical way leads to the first initiation. Having achieved its purpose, it is then renounced, and the lighted way of occultism is then followed, leading to the lighted areas of the higher states of consciousness. Thus, both ways are seen to be essential. The mystical way is for the majority at this time, and an increasingly large number of mystics will emerge out of the modern masses of men. Paralleling this, the occult way is attracting more and more of the world intelligentsia. Its experience is not basically religious, as the Orthodox Churchman understands the word. The way of science is as deeply needed by mankind as is the way of religion, for God is found equally on both ways. The scientific way leads the aspirant into the world of energies and forces, which is the true world of occult endeavor, revealing the universal mind and the workings of that great intelligence which created the manifested universe. The new man who has come to birth at the first initiation must and will tread the occult or scientific way, which inevitably leads him out of the world of mysticism into the scientific and assured perception of God as life or energy. The first initiation marks the beginning of a totally new life and mode of living. It marks the commencement of a new manner of thinking and of conscious perception. The life of the personality in the three worlds has for eons nurtured the germ of this new life and fostered the tiny spark of light within the relative darkness of the lower nature. This process is now being brought to a close, though it is not at this stage entirely discontinued, for the new man has to learn to walk, to talk, and to create. The consciousness is now, however, being focused elsewhere. This leads to much pain and suffering until the definite choice is made. A new dedication to service is vouchsafed, and the initiate is ready to undergo the baptism initiation. Members of the new group of world servers should watch with care for all those who show signs of having passed through the birth experience and should help them toward a greater maturity. They should assume that all those who truly love their fellow men, who are interested in the esoteric teaching and who seek to discipline themselves in order to attain greater beauty of life are initiate and have undergone the first initiation. When they discover those who are seeking mental polarization and who evidence a desire and aspiration to think and to know, coupled with the distinguishing marks of those who have taken the first initiation, they can, in all probability, 
safely assume that such people have taken the second initiation or are on the verge of so doing. Their duty will be clear. It is by this close observation on the part of the world servers that the ranks of the new group are filled. Today, the opportunity and the stimulation are so great that all servers must keep alert, developing in themselves the ability to register the quality for which search must be made, and giving the help and guidance which will weld into one cooperative band those disciples and initiates who should prepare the way for the Christ. The first initiation should be regarded as instituting a new attitude towards relationships. This is not yet the case. The relationships hitherto recognized, speaking generally, have been those karmically, physically, and emotionally instituted. They are largely objective and predominantly concerned the phenomenal plane with its contacts, duties, responsibilities, and obligations. The new relationships, however, to be increasingly recognized are subjective and may have but little phenomenal indication. They embrace the recognition of those who must be served. They involve the expansion of the individual consciousness into a growing group awareness. They lead eventually to an eager response to hierarchical quality and to the magnetic pull of the ashram. Such a development in the recognition of relationships leads finally to a recognition of the presence of the Christ and to relationship with him. With a recognition of and the relationship to the planetary logos, we need not at this point deal. All these relationships begin in their truest connotation with a correctly realized objective, the birth of the new man, to this the Christ referred when he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I am here using the Christian terminology, but prefer to speak of the new man rather than the strictly Christian phrase, the birth of the Christ child in the heart. It is by means of the touchstone of relationships that world servers can contact the initiates and the accepted disciples in the world and can discover those aspirants who can be helped and trained. Let me bring another point to your attention. In the phenomenal world of the average human being who has not yet passed through the initiatory experience of the rebirth, the emphasis has ever been and is today upon the dual relationship of the sexes and to this our novels, plays, movies, and affairs of all men bear testimony. Creativity expresses itself mainly through the propagation of the race, brought about through the relation of male and female, or of the positive and negative poles in the human family. This is right and good and part of the divine plan. Even though men have prostituted their capacities and debased their relationships, the basic plan is divine and ideal. After the first initiation, the entire sex relationship shifts gradually and steadily into its proper place as simply a natural phase of existence in the three worlds and as one of the normal and correct appetites, but the emphasis changes. The higher experience and correspondence, that of which physical sex is only the symbol, becomes apparent. Instead of male and female, there emerges the magnetic relationship between the now negative personality and the positive soul, with consequent creativity upon the higher planes. Of this relationship, the head center and the center between the eyebrows, the Ajna center, are the agents, and eventually, through the medium of the pituitary body and the pineal gland, they condition the personality, rendering it soul-infused. I have given you so much information and initiation and the rays and centers in my many books that there is no need for me to repeat it here. There is, however, great need for you to collect and tabulate the scattered information so that you can register it as a whole. Many who read these instructions and who study the books I have written are in process of preparation for one or other of the initiations, and the entire theme should therefore be, major, uh, be of major interest to you. You should decide, at least tentatively, which initiation lies ahead of you, and then discover all you possibly can about it and its prerequisites, endeavoring to make practical application of the imparted information. Either that which I give to you is true, or it is not. If true, it is vital to you, to your future progress, and you should aim at achieving a measure of real understanding. You have been taught the activity or the inactivity of the center's conditions, the personality. 
working through the endocrine system. The energies which the centers channel and the forces which they generate can be controlled and directed by the soul, by the spiritual man. You have likewise been told that the energy of the sacred center, the center most implicated and active at the time of the first initiation, has to be transmuted and raised to the throat center, thereby transforming the physical creative act into the creative process of producing the good, the beautiful, and the true. This is the ABC of your fundamental knowledge, the transmutation of sex. In that transmutative process, men have greatly erred have approached the subject from two angles. First, they have sought to stamp out natural desire and have endeavored to emphasize an enforced celibacy. They have thus frequently warped the nature and subjected the natural man to rules and regulations which were not of divine intent. Second, they have tried, at the other extreme, to exhaust normal sexual desire by promiscuity, license, and perversions, damaging themselves and laying up the basis for trouble for many incarnations ahead. True, trans true transmutation is in reality the achieving of a correct sense of proportion in relation to any phase of human life. And for the race of men today, has particular reference to the sacral center and the energies which bring it into activity. When a proper recognition of the place the sex life should play in the daily life is paralleled by the concentration of thought and at the throat center, that center becomes automatically magnetic and attracts the forces of the sacral center upward through the spine into the place of creative building. The normal sex life is then regulated and not atrophied and is relegated to its rightful place as one of the usual faculties or appetites with which man is endowed. It is brought under control through the lack of directed interest and is subordinated to the law of the land as regards its as regards its relation to its opposite pole, either negative and feminine or masculine and positive. To the aspirant, it becomes mainly the agent for the creation of the vehicles needed for reincarnating souls. Thus, by force of example, by the avoiding of all extremes, by the dedication of the bodily energies to the higher uses, and by the acceptance of the law of the land in any given country. And at, any, and, and at any given time, the present disorder and the current misuse of the sex principle will give way to orderly living and to the right use of this major bodily function. This regulated physical life comes about when the personality is sufficiently integrated and coordinated at the Ajna center, the center between the eyebrows, is active and is coming under the control of the soul. This has an immediate effect, automatically induced upon the gland associated with the center. It becomes a balanced part of the general endocrine system, and past imbalance is avoided. Simultaneously, the head center becomes active as a result of the aspirant's mental perception, meditation, and service. This brings the allied gland, the pineal gland, into action. All this is again only the ABC of occultism. What is oft omitted from normal consideration is the fact that the increasing activity of these two points of light within the head is basically related to what is occurring in the sacral and throat centers. As the transmutative process proceeds, and the energies of the sacral center are gathered up into the throat center, without, however, withdrawing all the energy from the lower center. Thus, its normal activity is properly preserved. The two centers in the head then become correspondingly active. The negative and the positive elements affect each other, and the light in the head shines forth. A line of light permitting free interplay is established between the Ajna center and the head center, and therefore between the pituitary body and the pineal gland. When this line of light is presented and there is an unobstructed relation between the two centers and the two glands, then the first initiation becomes possible. When this takes place, it must not be inferred that the task of transmutation going on between the lower and the higher centers and the relationship between the two head centers is fully and finally completed and established. The line of light is still tenuous and unstable, but it is in existence. It is the energy let loose at the first initiation and distributed into the sacral and the throat centers via the slowly awakening head center, which brings the transmutation process to a successful conclusion and stabilizes the relationship within the head. 
This process may take several lives of steadily intensifying effort on the part of the initiate disciple. Thus, the work of magical reformation starts, and it is here that the influence of the seventh ray, which governs the first initiation, enters in. One of the functions of this ray is to bring together soul and body, the higher and the lower, life and form, spirit and matter. This is the creative task confronting the disciple who is engaged in lifting the energies of the sacral center to the throat center and of establishing a right relation between the personality and the soul. Just as the Antikarana has to be constructed and established as a bridge of light between the spiritual triad and the soul-infused personality, so a similar bridge or correspondence is established between the soul and the personality, and in connection with the mechanism of the disciple between the two head centers and the two glands within the head. When that line of light has related the higher spiritual aspects and the lower, and when the sacral center and the throat center are in true related alignment, the initiate disciple becomes a creative worker under the divine plan and a magical exponent of the divine building work. He is then a constructive force, wielding energy consciously on the physical plane. He creates forms as expressions of reality. This is the true work of magic. You can see, therefore, that in the creative work, three energies are brought into a related activity. First, the energy concentrated in the Ajna center, and which is in indicative of the personality life. Second, the energy concentrated in the head center as a result of soul activity. Third, the energy of the seventh ray of ceremonial order or magic, making possible true creative activity under the divine plan. There is nothing spectacular to be told in at the first initiation. The initiate disciple still works in the dimly lit cave of the spiritual birth. He has to continue his struggle to reveal divinity primarily on the physical plane, symbolized for us in the word Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. He has to learn the dual function of lifting up the lower energies into the light, and at the same time of bringing down the higher energies into bodily expression. Thus, he becomes a white magician. At this initiation, he sees for the first time what are the major energies which he must bring into expression, and this vision is summed up for him in the old commentary in the following words. When the rod of initiation descends and touches the lower part of the spine, there is a lifting up. When the eyes are opened in the light, that which must be lowered into form is now perceived. The vision is acknowledged. The burden of the future is assumed. The cave is lighted up, and the new man issues forth. That this, may be, that this may be true of all of you who read these words is the prayer and the wish of your friend and counselor.